Inside the Paris Sea Palace, I have a 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Company on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today and a guy I've been waiting to talk to for some time. A rhythmatist who helps uh, set the table for new musical vocabulary on the bandstand. And he's been doing, he's been shedding for a long time and playing live in all types of different settings. Jeff Seip, welcome to the Jake Feinberg hey. Show. Hey, thank you. Welcome to Apartment Q258. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we are in a telephonic uh, dialogue right now. You know, I just, I, I wanted you to... Um, uh, I just remember in my interview with Mike Clark, um, the drummer, he was talking about in the mid seventies, kind of, um, you know, when pop music on the radio, when when it was becoming monetized and and all of a sudden producers were saying, Hey, play, we want you to play straight beats because that's what got the hit record last time. So just play straight beats as opposed to, uh, playing melodically or playing, you know, you know, like yourself. Mm-hmm. And Mike was like, I just, I, I wasn't into that. I, I wasn't into having to do that. I, I, I'd rather play bebop or jazz or whatever. And I just, I kind of wanted to know if there was ever a point in your um, professional career where, you know, um, you were trying, they were, it's, people were trying to conform you or try to oh. get you to move to a pop vein and ultimately how you've always tried to commit to yourself. Yeah, you know, the, what a beautiful, amazing, huge world this is. You know, there's everything is valid in my mind. You know, the straight pop beats, of course, they serve the the purpose, you know, uh, dance music and and such. And I've always been uh, intrigued with a little bit more uh, than just the straight beat. But as I get older, I appreciate the straighter beats more. And uh, like Al Jackson, you know, just sitting on a groove and trying to be consistent and loving it the whole way through. (laughs) I'm I'm finding myself more able to do that now that I'm in my 60s. (laughs) I mean, was it uh, you? Can you talk a little bit about like like early on, like how you really found your own individual time feel? I guess it leads into the fact that along the same time, you know, it was like, well, if we're going to play straight beats, then, you know, we can also like, you know, the drum machine was created so we can, you know, sort of remove, <laughs> remove the human element from it, uh, especially in the studio. Yeah. So, I mean, like, how did, can you talk a little bit about your evolution of your time feel? Well, sure. Yeah. You know, when I was young, I was, I was always drawn to the piano just to plunk out some melody. That's where it all began. And then I guess I was uh, 11 years old. Uh, the family had moved to Frankfurt, Germany. And so we were going to be there, stationed there for three years. And I was listening to, listening to a lot of American pop radio. So I was in tune with what was going on currently. And uh, some of the tunes I'd find real hokey, and some were really, really fascinating. Then I started opening up to uh, more progressive stuff. I heard about Emerson, Lincoln Palmer, and I went to see Emerson, Lincoln Palmer. And the drummer blew my mind, you know, for a young teenager to... Uh, coming into his teens, to hear that and see that and witness that, it was just, I didn't know that was possible. He could play that fast and that intricate, you know, and that interesting. So um, that awakened me. Um, so the progressive rock bands of Europe kind of caught my ear while I was over there, King Crimson and uh, Gentle Giant. And when I came back to the States, I was 14 years after that stint in Europe in Frankfurt. And when I came back, I was in school, and I met an older feller who was playing bass in the band, the school band. His name was Emmett Ingersoll. He was a great bassist, and he was real progressive, kind of ahead of his time. So I went to his house for a sleepover one night, and he he started playing all these great records I'd never heard before. <laughs> Stanley Clark, <laughs> you know, with, uh, with uh, Tony Williams, blew my mind, and... Uh, one album we kept on playing over and over was Bitches Brew. And that was my awakening to American jazz. And I guess it had been out a few years already, but 
I was hearing stuff I'd never heard before, and I didn't know if I liked it or not, but I, I couldn't stop listening to it. And that was my introduction to Miles Davis, and then I started uh, noticing the Sidemen on his albums. And I noticed, you know, there's McLaughlin, and there's, gosh, there's so many Dijonet, and just an amazing amount. Yeah, it was like, it was like Harvey more. Brooks, anyway, Harvey I Brooks, Lenny, on the Bitches Brew, it was Don Elias, yeah. and all these, like, uh-huh. crazy dudes on there, yeah. Really just wonderful, you know, it was, it was experimental, and it wasn't following any formula, but there was lots of conversation, and uh, lots of vibe, you know, so... yeah. I got interested in that, and that led me to, you know, everything else that I've heard since. It seems like all roads go back to Miles and Charlie Parker before him, or wow, you know, together, I guess they play together. That, that was my route. I mean, is there a way to talk a little bit about, um, in your mind, like, l- labels have, you know, they've, they've cropped up, bar- you know, even more in music today, but I guess when you talk about progressive progressive rock music um what you saw from uh from you know i guess it was emerson lake and palmer uh you know um you know what what was it that made it progressive was it the was it the rhythm yeah largely the rhythm but also the harmony you know uh it more adventurous harmonies for sure it seems like in the elements of music, you know, you have melody, harmony, and rhythm that make up everything. It seems to me that if you have a beautiful melody and something that's catchy, you can be more experimental with the harmony and the rhythm as long as the melody is uh, something you can grab onto. Uh, but it seems like any one of those elements can be um, basic and the others can go out. So if the rhythm is real simple, Maybe the melody can be more adventurous, but it's a it's a balance of of those things. My ear uh, wants to hear interesting harmonies, a beautiful melody, and something different in the rhythm that that uh, distinguishes itself and makes it its own. Uh, so, um, oh, I mean, have, is it is it fair to say that like, I, just because it's not really my bag, but I mean, we're we're like. I don't know the, that band Focus. Did you know about that band? Yeah, oh, I love them, dude. Yeah. They are smoking hot, and like, I mean, they were just yeah. burning. And like, I, I just wonder about like a lot of people talk about. Well, when I interviewed the bassist Larry Klein, whether the story is true or not, because Ron Carter told me a different story. But basically, like at the Plug Nickel, you know, the, those sessions with Miles. Uh, yeah. That um, you know, Miles was kind of bored to death of of playing bebop or playing the same stuff and and then t- so it was tony and and ron and herbie and they were like they made a blood oath that they said listen we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do this thing tonight where we um uh you know we're gonna leave the head of the tune and and break up time and form on tunes like my funny valentine and and uh yeah. Let's see what happened. And they didn't tell Miles, so they showed up at the club, and Miles was like, because they were getting bored of, of the same music too. And Miles was like, "We're recording tonight," you know. And they were like, "Oh crap!" They're like, "Well, we're still going to do it. We still have to do it." <laughs> and Miles dug it. He really dug it. And that was so. Like, I mean, was what was the first time that that you that you um, sort of got hip to the idea of of because to me, like, that's what. I mean, people, you'll get 20 different defin- definitions of what jazz is, but it's yeah. like, to me, it's, it's it's spiritual music merged with the American songbook and then never playing that song the same way once. Same way twice. Same way, yeah, whatever, you, you know. It's same like, way once. Same way once, you know, and, I, and I'm like trying to like, I would just would love to get the Sype definition of, of jazz. And then also, <laughs> also like, when you really first started to experiment or were those progressive rock bands breaking up time and form? Or was it really Ron and Tony from the mid '60s in your mind? No, I think it was a whole uh, mindset of a culture. You know, uh, familiarity was a little bit boring, so why not switch it up, change right, it up? Right. And it's funny you mentioned that. You know, when I was in high school, my band director suggested I check out this particular album, four or more. And oh, when I heard man, that line, dude, that's an insane album, man. 
Incredible. And, uh, yeah, just like you say, they're taking it and they're bending it, twisting it, breaking it up, and putting it back together and reorganizing it. It's not traditional at all. It's really kind of a, a challenge to tradition using using the standards. And so when I heard, uh, for the first time, I heard Tony Williams playing a broken ride pattern. So it wasn't just ding, 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 ding. It was ding 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 ding, you know, <laughs> all over the place, and it was wonderful. And it was, so I sat down at the drum set and I started to try to emulate that, and I, I found it fun. It was uh, it was joyful. It wasn't just riding a horse; it was steering a horse, you know, and it, it was a beautiful thing. And so, sitting down at the, the kit, trying to play some of that stuff was a, something I'll never forget. You know, like you always. Re- Remember where you were at a very important time in your life, exactly. You can see the colors around you. You know what the weather was like that day. Absolutely. Uh, that was a, a breakthrough for me, an epiphany. So. I mean, do you, I saw a band last night, some buddies of mine, and they were really playing some, uh, I mean, it was groove music. It's not, I, to me, it's like, I think in today's modern era, if you're, not playing with dynamics um it's you know everyone's gonna have their own palette but i i was watching this group uh fusing together uh rhythms and harmonies and melodies from the late 60s all the way through modern times and i just wonder you know how what is your what is your thoughts on how to what what is the best way for a, a a unit or collective um to hone in on creating new musical vocabulary you know i've become pretty obsessed with just growing vocabulary and music and i just when i asked ron carter this uh he said that you know the rhythm section can set the table for the as long as the soloist is what he said he goes as long as they bring their kitchen sink solos to the bandstand you know what they practice at home um yeah you know and i wanted you to talk about even a, a, a band you were in where you guys were making a concerted effort to increase musical vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. What comes to mind is working with Colonel Bruce Hampton, who I met when I moved to Atlanta from Boston in 1983. I guess 1984 I met him. And working with him was the first chance I got to play with someone who was really, like Miles, looking for something new. And uh, I remember <laughs> one gig we were playing with O'Teal Burbridge and Jimmy Herring. And I think Dan Matraza was on the gig. And we were playing all of our Berkeley stuff. You know, we were playing all of our uh, our practice room right. chops. Right. And uh, he stopped us in the middle of a song. He said, what is this, Berkeley? And he he started playing the most most random notes, weird stuff we'd ever heard and we just busted out laughing and we joined him wow. and just played out as could be uh, experiments we finally coalesced into a band and we took that as a teaching you know kind of a kind of a, a lesson in uh, the fact that you you can search for stuff and that was a safe place to do it you could try anything on the bandstand as long as the intention was pure as long as you were trying to go somewhere musically um, interesting and new. He, Bruce loved it, so he encouraged us. And, and we were all just crazy practicers back then, we, you know, marathon practicing every day. So every time we got together uh, on the bandstand, and we played quite often, somebody would bring something new, or we'd laugh about something, and that would become an inside joke, and we'd repeat it and toss it around the stage. And it was a, it was a great. Uh, environment to grow because there was no taboos and um, anytime we we got full of ourselves and a little bit musically cocky Bruce would remind us and tear it back down again so it was a it was a constant building up building Bruce up to this this great uh, you know hold him on a silver platter and then he would destroy it and we'd all laugh and go play out. And then we'd build him up again, you know, and he'd destroy it again. It, it was such fun. It was like kids on a playground. Hey, let me ask you, though. I mean, is, is, is it, I mean, setting aside just the vibe he would bring and the leadership and, and just, you know, his, his like, you know, character. I mean, he didn't yeah. – he, he wasn't a Berkeley cat, right? So, I mean, it was like he was no. – 
he was fusing his own sort of weird truth into more yeah. like wonkish, uh, yeah. well, whatever you want to call it. But so how did, I mean, ultimately as a drummer, when you get into those situations, I mean, are you, how, how, what are you listening to most importantly? Cause it's, you basically, it's spontaneous organic creation at that point. Yeah. Right. Well, each of us would, would suggest something and we would, without hesitation, jump on it and celebrate it. So even if it was a, a corny little riff, we would just play it like we loved it to death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and let's see, uh, Bruce had a way of inviting us into the truth of music. And what he considered the truth in music was really playing, he called it playing from your butt. So you can play from your butt, or you can play from your heart, you can play from your mind. And if it's all in balance, it sounds great. But if you're only playing from your mind, it, it didn't have enough uh, earthiness. If you're only playing from your heart, it might be too dramatic and not not grounded enough and maybe uh but if you play from your butt <laughs> if you make it real and if you don't mind mistakes and you're just being honest then um that had a timeless quality to it and so we'd be we'd be traveling from gig to gig and Bruce would be driving or riding along and the radio would be on and he'd hear something he'd change the channel and he changed the channel again until he found something that was really honest. And he loved the blues. He loved the old blues masters. And uh, he invited us to listen to the honesty and the, the depth of that music without any polish. Uh, and so <laughs> he would go from channel to channel. Liars changed the channel. Liars. <laughs> because 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 it was it was it was yeah i mean is it fair to say that he i mean it, he, really what he was saying was like playing from the primordial gut i mean that's what he was looking for like when he says playing from your butt i mean i i would say that's going to the primordial gut area like the the the, yeah. the spirit right. you know and i mean to me yeah. that's like that's he can he can impart that on you but is that something that you can only really learn in in the moment on the bandstand, like when you're in that moment, or is it something that can be taught? I think it's something that resonates with you, you know. Wherever you're at in your life and whatever you value uh, and hold as as your truth and your, your beauty and what you go for, you know, it, it's different from for everybody. But Bruce would remind us that, you know, honesty in music didn't sound pretty sometimes sometimes it sounded ugly but it's it's uh it's honest it's truthful and it, and it, if it's painful and and it expanded our our horizons and gave us a sense of history where things came from it's hard to hard to make the connection from uh uh you know muddy waters to uh kenny g it's hard to make that connection man <laughs> yeah well but i mean way, yeah no i mean you know, you know? It's, it's 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 just like what what i mean looking back on it because uh, i know like for so many cats their apprenticeship with uh their, you know working with colonel bruce was some of the most impactful stuff they've ever done in their lives you know for the very reasons you're talking about but i'm just wondering about you went to berkeley or you were at least in ball you know you went to what yeah, what can I did, a, I did one year at Berkeley, right? Yeah. Okay, so you did one year. I mean, um, just educate me on on what is something that you picked up on that you can honestly translate on the bandstand on a nightly basis from academia. Oh sure, right. You know, um, you know what it is. Here's the, I just want to preface it because, okay. I mean, you know, going back to. Harvey Mason, you know, the guy was doing duets with Alan Dawson, and then Alan Dawson was give, was calling him to sub on gigs with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. And Gene Perla had, like, you know, a salsa band with Mark Levine on trombone, and, you know, Miroslav Vitius was playing. And, like, and the point is that it was, like, there, it was not the academy. I mean, it was still a street music. The music was still on the street. 
And I wonder yeah. at, at the time when you were there, what was the most? And like, oh, yeah. it, it could have been in the. It could have been an academic thing. It could have been with a. I just don't think that. I think there's a major crisis now. I mean, it's great that people can get a paycheck. I, I think it's great you can teach, and that's. But the problem is that. Um, Cats like yourself from 30 years ago are just inundated with so much uh, literature and material and books. And so they either wind up sounding like the people they're studying or they sound up, wind oh, yeah. up sounding like their teacher instead of sounding like themselves. And that's, well, uh, you know what I'm saying? You just riff on that. Right. Sure, exactly, yeah. We all, uh, I think, um, grow and emulate that which we love. So... If you fall in love with yourself and your own sound, you're going to be real original. Of course, you know, when you're coming up and you're fascinated with uh, different music and musicians and you want to sound as good as they do, you take the stuff that really excites you about them and practice that. But that might involve a hundred different players taking a little bit from everybody to make, uh, to build your own vocabulary. Um, it seems like. Uh, some people who are so original that they don't care about what everybody else is doing. They're not concerned uh, about the paycheck. They're not concerned about monetizing it or the commercial value of it. They're just creating, you know, pure artists. Um, yeah, sometimes that's like, that's that, like the, that, that, that sounds like the Jake Feinberg show, actually. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but no, I mean, can you, can you name some people? I'm curious about the, these infinite sure. artists, you know? Right, yeah. Let's see, it was 1977. I graduated high school, and 78, I was up, 77, 78, I was up in Boston. And I did see Alan Dawson quite a few times. But it seemed I was um, part of a generation that was coming in just after the post bop acoustic musicians and the electric jazz musicians were starting to come. Exactly. Uh, onto the exactly, scene. yeah. So Gary Burton had taught and he'd moved out and Alan Dawson had taught and he'd moved out and then um, the likes of you know Kevin Eubanks and Steve Vai and you know, the fusion cats uh, students of, of the fusion movement were were uh, attending school then so I got to see this this beautiful marriage between the uh, you know the Keith Jarrett Bob Moses uh, um that kind of stuff, and then going into the Mike Stern, Steve Vai, and uh, well, I, I need you stuff. to break this down. This is so vital. Like, what what was the Keith Jarrett Rock Alarm thing, vert, and then how was that different from the uh, Mike Stern Vai? Just for the audience out there, the Vai yeah. Stern versus Jarrett uh -huh. Rock Alarm kind of stuff. How how was it different? Right. Well, the vocabulary is constantly um, uh, growing. So there's there's more patterns, there's more shapes, and there's more uh, textures available now. There's more to the table, and uh, the textures of um, absolute purity all the way to absolute distortion uh, are all acceptable now. Maybe they they weren't back in the day so much. So we have a bigger palette. We have more to work with, and. Um, there's also the influences of classical music, even like thinking of Frank Zappa and his love for Edgar Varese right. and his use of polyrhythms. Bringing that into commercial music uh, seemed like that was definitely not going to work, you know, conceptually. But he <laughs> he really <laughs> he proved us wrong. You know, you can play quintuplets inside of uh, single note groupings and uh, and make it beautiful and and elastic and, and wonderful. So I think uh, I was um, I was coming along at a really cool time when I was uh, witnessing the, the masters of like Cannonball, Adderley, uh, Post Bop into the, the Hendrix uh, and Miles Electric stuff. I got to see Miles Davis first, uh, first concert at Kix in Boston after his 10-year hiatus. Wow. Oh, yes, yes. So, wait, hold on. Like, like, what year was this? 81 or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. Jesus, 81, that must have been tripped right. out, man. What was that like? It was a small room. There's only 50 people set up in metal chairs. And so at one point, so Al Foster's playing, Bill Evans is playing. Um, it, was, it was a really great group. And so 
um, Miles looked over at Mike Stern, you know, nodded to him, you know, take a solo. So Miles, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mike Stern was playing, and it was a bluesy, bluesy solo, and he was taking it way down in dynamics, and the whole band came way down. And Mike Stern had his eyes closed, just playing beautiful and slow, and <laughs> his eyes pop open when he feels Miles' hand on his face <laughs> caressing it during a solo. What? Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. His hand was actually on his face? He came, Miles came over to him while he was soloing and his eyes closed and just started stroking his face just tenderly caressing him. Oh, my him. God. That <laughs> is so great, dude. How do you finish a solo? With that? I mean, that, I mean, but he, I mean, that is, well, that's, this is led talking to Jeff Sipe here on the Jake Feinberg show. Um, we have a game on this program called uh, Name That Voice. I'm going to put this in for you right now and then come back and break it down. Sure. My name is Kofi. Otio's uh-huh. name is Otio. We have two sisters, Leilani and Adara. Our parents are Carol and Bill. They're from Bronx, New York. I was born in the Bronx. The rest of the family was born in D.C., we're in Northeast, primarily, you know, give or take, D.C.'s location. Uh, they were, uh, they they were prime. Uh, they were on top of and and influenced and fired up by culture. And this is we're talking sixty one is when I was born. Okay, mm. so. So they already were headstrong about uh, receiving any information about Africa, uh, anything that had to to do with its influence on African Americans, and uh, and so they wanted to open that up to us, uh, seeing that we were so hyped on the music and. This is the secondary part that I'll try to get to briefly. My dad was really into collecting records. Oh, I love Music it. fired him up. Is that cat still? He, is he still with us? By the way, he is still with us. Both are still with us. Was, was he, he at was cannot, he at Bird, was he at Birdland? By the way, did he must have gone to Birdland a lot? Uh, I even think that he may have snuck a tape recorder into. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realize that that he said his name. But I'm so honored to, today on this day to be able to honor um, a guy I've never met before. But uh, we had a great hang on my show in September 2017, and uh, I realize now that my show, after eight years and all this stuff, is a lot of it is about um, you know not just uh, you know remembering but honoring the spirits that. Uh, the beautiful spirits that have left this earth. And I, I just want, the floor is yours, man. I, I just would yeah. love you to talk about, about, uh, that was obviously Kofi Burbridge, <laughs> but I just, yeah. I wanted you to talk yeah. about how you met him and, and uh, a little bit about his legacy to modern music. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Um, Kofi Burbridge and Oteo, I met when they came to Atlanta from Virginia beach, they had known this um, singer named Sam Guest who was living in Atlanta. So I was working in a top 40 band with Dan Hofflinger called Knee Deep, and we needed a bass player. And they said, well, this is amazing. We have these two brothers who are geniuses, and they, <laughs> they're willing to come down. They're looking for some work. So they came down, and they played with us, and of course they got the gig. Uh, I remember the first time, first time I met them, they came over to the house. We set up. And we started playing and laughing and playing for hours. And I have a tape of that. I'll, I'll give it to you sometime. It's it's pretty cool. Jeff, I need well, to. He- I, Jeff, I need to hear the tape immediately. That is magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's really incredible. The, the spirit on it is really alive. But Kofi, uh, I can't say enough about. It. He's um, was a wonderful human being. He took his time with you. When he looked at you, his eyes were just filled with love and understanding. And patience, I could tell a lot of the times when he might have been frustrated with me. But in a godlike way, in a very giving, loving way, he always 
had so much patience with me, and I learned so much from him. I, I recorded so many songs with him, and I kid you not, I'm not lying, this is the truth. Every single take that he recorded when I was with him was his first take. And sometimes somebody would say, hey, do you want to do a second take and try this? And he would, just to accommodate. But everybody chose the first take, ultimately. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that flute, piano, I mean, he had it all in his head. He knew what he was going to do, and he did it flawlessly and with feeling. He's one of the only cats I've ever known that it was that deep, that loving, that giving. Uh, I choke up a little bit because he was a dear friend. <laughs> And, uh, I know it's. I, I was just story. so honored to be able to talk to you today because uh, Kofi and I were. Um, we had such a ball, and I'll send you. I didn't send you this interview on purpose, but I, I will send it to you later because it's just. I mean, we went for an hour and forty minutes, and and uh, it was just like. <laughs> so we were gonna make. You can talk about anything, right? Well, I mean, we like. I mean, even in, in that, it was just it, the idea was that you know a lot of the time you, you gotta, uh, you know, a lot of the time you 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 got to know where you're going. You got to know where you came from to know where you're going. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah like, you know, in, in, in your lineage and, and, and I played that one clip kind of randomly, but he was talking about his, his parents. And, and he went on to talk about like, you know, his dad would have like Fela Kuti records on the wall and he was going to Birdland yeah. And like, I mean, the, the point is that they were all fired up. I mean, it was, it, it came from the source and the love yeah. and that mu- and then obviously their acumen musically was off the charts. I mean, the guy was like, you know, playing with Donald Byrd at, at, at the Howard University, you know, when he was like 12 years old. So it's yeah. like, I mean, but but it, it, what it what it comes down to is, to me, is is about love. And when in knee deep, um, when you guys started to cook, I mean, did that did those guys immediately add vocabulary to the band? That was a short-lived group. It was a top forty thing, and we were. Oh, really it was cover tunes. Of... Did you actually? Yeah. When was the first time did you, did you able to? Because Kofi was telling me about a band, um, with you in it. I think, uh, oh, man, a... and it was Pastori. <laughs> Pastori. Pas- it was just. It was this one long slogging. I was asking about out of out of body experiences on the bandstand, and he was uh, ta- he was talking yeah. about getting to a club. You guys were really disgruntled. It was a rough weather. Everybody was beaten down and not feeling that great. I'll, I'll, say, I'll actually have to get the transcript to you, but he just said that that night was magic. For some reason, it was just the yeah. fatigue. was. And, and so when did you guys actually hit the road together for the first time? Shoot. Uh, let's see. So we did the, uh, the Knee Deep thing. Then we did a, a band called Mystificus, which was with Jimmy Herring, O'Teal, uh, Kofi, myself, and Charlie Williams, and we never toured, but we played together uh, a lot and wrote a lot of songs together. Do you play locally or or ever live? Yeah, or? it was in the yeah. Atlanta area. Oh, this is yeah. this is so important, Saifa. This is this is essential <laughs> essential for humanity, dude. Out of that, and let me see. Um, oh, so many recordings and the Jimmy Herring albums, um, Jason Crosby. Yeah, we let in with. Uh, Oh, uh, Osiris. It's one of my favorite tunes on Timeless. It's a yeah. Scythe album. It's so sick with Paul Hansen and Kofi and Crosby. Um, yeah, what a dream team. Dude, I mean, I mean, in in essence, it's with all like, have you ever? Obviously, for accommodation, someone like Kofi would do a second take or a third take. But have you ever? Have you always been somebody who? has just tried to, like you talked about honesty, truth in music, as, as Colonel Bruce would say, but just like, I, I, have, have you always just tried to make uh, whatever you're playing uh, honest? Uh, what I mean by that is like, you know, Stan Getz, they were interviewing him one time, they're like, yeah, man, you know, all your contemporaries are like Train and, and uh, you know, Sonny Rollins or whatever, they're all playing this really complex, heady stuff, and um, you know, you're just channeling, you know, Prez, you know, the, you know, Lester Young, you know, whatever. And, 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 and Stan was like, well, you know what, I just, all I've ever tried to do, every note I've tried to play, I've tried to be as honest as I can be, you know, and, and yeah. that, that is so hard to do in, in today's world where there is such a lack of authenticity, not just in music, 
but in how musicians are, you know, I mean, you know, the way the, yeah. the, 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 the cats in Nashville look like Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash and those, <laughs> but they're not outlaws, you know, they're, 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 they're being, <laughs> the fashion industry has taken over. So there's all this sort of slide deception, which takes away from being honest. And I, and yeah. I, I mean, I want you to just talk about that. I mean, how have you been able to, have you always just put yourselves in, in musical situations yeah. where you can sing for your supper, but you know that you're not wanking it or being in a, in a situation where you can't be honest. Yeah, I know what you're saying. For me, uh, there is a purity and sacredness in a single note and vibrations, and that spills out into form and function and music and styles and genres and uh, you know, commodities. But it all comes from a pure source, vibration. I fell in love with music and the playfulness and the spirit of music and musicians playing with each other. That wasn't just, uh, uh, you know, uh, playing a role, but actually playing. Like kids play on the playground, you know, and laughing right. and having fun. Right, right, right. So, Honest fun. So music, yeah. yeah, music is my playground, and, and like minds attract. And so I think when you find your brothers and your sisters and, and the, of like mind and you really have fun doing it, it's infectious and more people find out about it. So I think I've been lucky and I've searched out those who are willing to play, not, you know, really play as in the true meaning of the word play. And that, that, that's a two way street, you know, that's, um, you, you can't just show up and play by yourself. I guess you can, but what's the fun in that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like, I mean, like, uh, it's. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this natural vibration uh, of rhythm? I, I really, you were riffing on that. I, 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 you're just your own philosophy as it relates to um, the healing quality of rhythm. Because music, for me, I, I mean, I went to Boston University and, and I graduated in 2000, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd go to Somerville Theater to go see Rock Alarm, uh, to Bob Moses, or I'd, you know, I'd go you see... You saw The Fringe? Galati and The Fringe? I, you know, dude, you fringe? know, you, I, I, we got to do... I mean, this... I don't know about The Fringe. I mean, I saw The Slip. That was, like, The Slip and The... Um, and then also, like, you know, like, you know, guys like, uh, you know, Bill Frizzell would come in to, yeah. you know, play. And, and I used to just go as something of, like, it was more like... A, Something that I, um, well, I was just beginning to get into music, melodic, improvisational music. But I just, I was going. My intentions for being there were just, uh, I was supposed to be there. It was a weekend, or it was going to be a hot show. I didn't really know. Now, to me, everywhere I go, I mean, it is. I'm trying to get in front of the speakers. I'm trying to get the natural sound of the stage. Obviously, it's harder yeah. to do it, but I mean, I am. He, the last few years, the the significance of music has changed for me dramatically because it's completely vibrational and healing. And yeah. I, I just would love you to talk about how music has has healed you. It's it's something I found that um, it was the first thing in life, in my life, that I found out that I could I could do I could grasp a little bit at a time, make an improvement. And each day I'd be better at something. Um, it, that was the only thing in my life, I think, that gave me that sense of, okay, you can do something, you can be somebody, stay with it. And um, it was a love for music, but I felt like music loved me too. And Explain and that. So Explain I, that. <laughs> well, if you've ever got goosebumps listening to something gorgeous, you yeah. know music loves you too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I dig, man. I dig it. I dig. Yeah, so when I was, um, so I guess I've been playing about 10 years or so before I got up to Boston, maybe seven years or so. And there was this place called Pooh's Pub on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, and we used to go to that. And I would see Bill Frizzell play, uh, Tiger Okoshi, who's a great uh, electric trumpet player Holy from cow. Japan. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he, and he had Kermit Driscoll playing with him, and he had Bill Frizzell and sometimes Kevin Eubanks, Tommy Campbell on drums. And uh, so I saw a bunch of stuff there, and I was an 18-year-old sitting in the front row, mouth open, wide-eyed, 
you know, just loving it. <laughs> um, I felt like that was the community. They were speaking a language that I wanted to be fluent in, but I was just scratching the surface. And it was an invitation into uh, a, a sacred space. I really felt like that, you know. They weren't doing it for the money, that's for sure. Well, but also, I mean, it. what you said before was interesting. You said, you know, you, you it, it was something that you could, music was something you could work on and get better at every day. So you knew that these cats were playing a language that you wanted to get to. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and maybe it wasn't, it, that was achievable. I mean, it, as long as you kept working at it, you could get, I mean, maybe not aspire to that exact type of music, but you could get there. It wasn't something that was insurmountable. And uh, yeah. and I think yeah. that, that yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, and everything that surrounded it too. It wasn't just the music. It was it was watching those guys prepare for the gig, uh, tune up. There was something special about watching somebody focusing so hard on getting that the intonation right, or just watching Alan Dawson walk to the drum throne across the room, stepping up a step onto stage, sitting behind the set with a, with a. Uh, straight posture and a suit on wow. smiling regally like a like a king and looking out over the room and you just felt good and he hadn't even played a note you know uh, so watching people who were really into their thing they don't even know what they're doing but you're watching them and you you get impressions you know what what kind of person is this how much do they love what they're doing it's obvious it's really obvious so, uh, and and the whole vibe, the aura that they give off before they even play a note. Um, for example, I play with a, I'm lucky to play with a guitar player named Mike Seal. He's a fingerstyle player who started off as an Appalachian uh, guitar player. So he knows the American songbook and he comes from folk and bluegrass. But he also got hit to harmony and studied. So he's got this great marriage of. Um, wonderful harmony, fantastic chops, and a rootedness in the Appalachian music. and Kind of like Frizzell, but he's got his own thing. Anyway, I met him when he was just turning 20. It was in Knoxville, and we were playing uh, with a band called Primordial Soup. And so I met the guy. Hello, hello. I'm setting up my drums. He's plugging in his guitar. He starts to tune his guitar, and there was something special about it. And I looked over at him. And he hadn't even played a song yet. It was just the way he touched the strings and the way he was in, uh, getting in tune with the, with the instrument. I felt like, wow, there's really something special about this guy. Uh, and I don't know how it is that that is conveyed without even playing the song. I knew this guy was deep, you know. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, no, I dig. I, dig. I mean, do you feel like uh, you were able to... Um, you know, just for for, for myself, you know, t uh, twenty years ago, um, I think I saw music as uh, as a you know something that you sat and uh, received. Uh, but I really believe that it's really about letting the body dance. And I I wonder, as a live performer, the way you are. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, like I said, I have to be up in the front, and I just want to be grooving the whole time and mm -hmm. i wonder if you could talk a little bit about um you know how the significance of music has changed in our culture especially live music because i have people coming up to me sometimes at a half-filled bar and they're like tapping me on the shoulder saying hey you know you're blocking my view and it's like what like music is made for dancing you know like like you can just move your seat <laughs> like it, we, we we've been taught to sit and stare at somebody's facility. And again, I mean, there's, like you said, you were in the front row, eyes wide open, but there's something about letting the body dance. And I just, how, how is music, the significance of music changed in our culture? That's a deep question. I, I need a couple of days to... to no, we'll do, then we'll do part two. Then we'll, that, then we'll just end. <laughs> let, 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 let's, you know, because I, I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta do another interview, but... I, Sipe, let's okay. let let's do part two, man. We got to do do some more. This was this was a ball. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you for the time and the opportunity. I do appreciate it. All right, man. I'll talk to you real soon. All right, peace. Peace, man. Oh, great cat, amazing rhythmist, Jeff Sipe.
We'll be back with Ray Obieto on the Jake Fun.